Hey everyone, good morning. Uh -uh, oh my gosh. <clears throat> Already starting off with no voice, but we're going to be totally fine. Welcome to Daily Drop-In. It's so, so, so wonderful to be here with you Thursday morning, October 28th. It is a very special day because the Teach Better team um, made a huge announcement about our Teach Better conference last night. We we're so appreciative that our whole network showed up to hear the big news. Um, this morning, we are going to continue that celebration. We have an incredible guest with us on Daily Drop-In. We obviously have a good news article, and we'll continue with our theme. So we're going to play a little special clip that we played last night, in case you missed it, for the big announcement of the Teach Better 2022 conference, and then we'll get started for our phenomenal day. So feel free to say good morning in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from, and we'll be right back. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Daily Drop-In. It is Thursday, October 28th. Thank you to those of you who tuned in with us last night for the big news. We have Angie with us and friends. I cannot tell you how excited I am for you to meet one of my really, really good friends today at Daily Drop-In. Angie, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, I was so thrilled when we finally got this coordinated. And I've been telling our network, Angie, the entire week, I'm like, we have new friends joining this week to add to your network, and I'm so, so excited that you found the time to join us. So for people who may not be connected to you or may not know the incredible work you do, they're all going to be fans after today. Would you mind sharing a little about yourself? Absolutely. So once again, thanks for having me. Um, and name is Angie Cherubek, and I'm the executive director of the BAR Center. And BAR stands for Building Assets, Reducing Risks. Happy to give you a little of my story of my life, if you'd like, yes. um, bright and early here in the morning. So um, I um, was a high school counselor out of First Ring suburb outside Minneapolis, had five years running that half the ninth graders failed a class. I was so discouraged. Thank you, Ray. And I was doing like all the best practices. And I was um, going to the middle school to identify the at-risk kids. And I'm meeting with my colleagues. And I have amazing colleagues. And we keep having half the kids fail. And so um, kind of the final kicker for me was I then found out the honors kids who I thought were doing great were um, using Ritalin. And so I'm like, these kids are not thriving and I'm responsible for them. I um, went to the principal to resign and said, I clearly cannot do this job. This job is really important. So I am going to resign in great principal who said, hey, this isn't you. It's not our school, this is the national average, about half the ninth graders fail a class. So if you've got a better system, you know, kind of come back to me, but, you know, in some ways, you know, don't take this too personally. This is what happens. 
So I went home and I have two kids and my kids were little at the time. And so um, I had a six month old son. My son's name is Jonah and my daughter was four. Her name is Haley. And I'm looking at this and going, okay, what can I do? What can I do? Coming up with new strategies and Haley's in a little kiddie pool. And I look over and she grabs a handful of crayons and takes a bite of them. And I am like, okay, I am not doing well here at parenting. I'm not doing well at professionalism. I am very frustrated. So um, I call my grandmother because that feels like the right thing to do when things are hard. <laughs> so exactly. So my grandma does not miss a beat and immediately launches into the fact that she'd picked up Haley from Sunday school and the Sunday school teacher had said how helpful she'd been to a little girl that was shy. And then my sister reminded me when she took her to the playground, how brave she'd been on the playground. And I had this epiphany at this moment that I was a better parent based on information I had from other adults that were with my kid when I wasn't there and that I was able to see kind of how they were doing, not in my purview, but I was able to parent better. And I go, teachers don't have that. High school teachers only have their experience for 40 minutes. And so that was really the beginning of BAR. And so BAR is based on two pillars. One is based on relationships. We have to have structures and processes in place to facilitate relationships from staff to student, student to student, and then staff to staff. A lot of people miss the staff to staff one. And the other piece is data, that you have to have transparency in data. I, as the high school counselor, cannot be the only person that knows that even though Ray's struggling in math, she is an incredible writer and a voracious reader. The math teacher has to know that too. And the other piece is qualitative data. Teachers just have an incredible intuition. They see things out of the corner of their eye. They need to have a strength-based way to share it. Mm -hmm. So Barr went into place, and um, over the next 10 years, our failure rate dropped, as well as the number of kids going into honors classes went through the roof. The school was in Minnesota. Our graduation rate for black males was over 90%. State average was at 60%. And I thought, any school should be able to do this. We're not replacing the curriculum. We're using their incredibly talented staff that's there. And we're not, you know, making any other structural changes. And so we did tons of testing. I got $35 million of grants to do research. And um, we did the highest level of research you could do. We'd go to a school and we would um, train part of the school. So because our thing is training the adults, paying part of the school, randomly assign students to teachers that are in this um, trained part of bar. Other teachers, you know, other students are in the control part. And at the end of the year, be able to say, how did they do? And students earn more credits. Students are happier. Students have higher standardized test scores. They come more. And it's really leveraging the incredible talent of um, educators. So now we're in 200 schools in 22 states across D.C. So that was me at, you know, 6 a.m. <laughs> in, in four or five minutes. No, honestly, Angie, that was one thing when we connected. I mean, not only hearing your story, but hearing your passion. And it really is rooted in this concept of sharing, mm -hmm. which is something that I feel so strongly about. And it was so wonderful and inspiring to connect with somebody who really has built a nonprofit dedicated mm -hmm. to helping teachers share. Mm -hmm. I mean, what an, what an outstanding opportunity. And I know that the schools you're in now, you're doing great work in, but just wait one year from now, two years from now, five years from now, you, you got to be everywhere because the concept of sharing is essential. It was essential two years ago, mm -hmm. but it's essential right now. And I I, it's unreal. I completely agree. And I think that one of the pieces that sharing does is really unleash the talent that we have in our educators. Mm -hmm. I keep going, educators are brilliant. I think that if you are called to this profession, you know, you have this incredible gift. But how do we have that gift be shared with others than just the students you're working with? And so our whole model, yes, is predicated on, first of all, sharing within the school. But then we have our schools working together, too. So we have our schools that are in you know, rural Appalachia working with urban Compton and Boston and Baltimore because the ability to, to share the information and the ability to really connect, I think is, is paramount, especially you know, as you're talking about, it, was, it always was before, but now since the pandemic, that interconnectedness is absolutely critical. So important. You know, the theme this week that we've been able to touch on kind of like consistently has been this idea of reaching all of our students, supporting all of our students. Mm -hmm. And I knew that you'd be so good to provide some insight for this week because 
so much of your story is simply with the basis of we need to better connect with our kids. And the first way to do that is to really get a whole picture of who they are. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I know we're going to get into that during our brainstorming segment. I'm excited to, to talk about your, your strategies, your ideas for that, but just in like a simple way. So you create bar, you have mm -hmm. all these schools around the world, around the U S specifically utilizing it mm -hmm. and you're getting published in academic journals, like up the wazoo, like literally <laughs> you're everywhere. Can you tell me about that space? Cause that's not a space that we typically talk through. And I know mm -hmm. as educators, we value research and we value academia, but mm -hmm. we don't always see the research. So I'd love for you to dive into that a little more because you're in journals everywhere. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate it. I think one of the reasons that um, we are so widely published is as an educator, I really wanted to make sure that this worked before I spent not only money, but in particular teachers time and effort, you know, to, I needed to know that if, if they did this, it would work because we just don't have um, not only the the resources, but I just don't think the goodwill of teachers. Like I could not in good faith say, do this unless I knew that this would make a difference. So we have spent 20 years doing research before we started rolling it out, you know, which is the other piece that's been a little bit interesting because our initial schools were all, you know, doing the, the research. And as I had shared is we've worked with AIR, which is a huge powerhouse in terms of evaluation. We worked with APT. All of our research has been done not by our team. Cause I also was like, I recognize I have a bias. I got a horse in the race here. Of course I want this to work and I need this to be clean. Mm -hmm. I also, once again, prior to the studies that we did, there were very few studies done um, with this level of, of rigor. You know, so like medicine always does randomized control trials. In, before that, they said in particular, high schools couldn't do that. Well, I was a high school counselor. I can build a master schedule for almost anything to fit in the singleton class. And I can get, you know, orchestra and Japanese and pottery, you know, all built into a schedule. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure I can help a school build a schedule that would in general keep the study clean. If anything, it's gonna show that the effects are lower because you're gonna have quote unquote contamination because teachers are gonna share ideas within the school. But in general, you're gonna be able to, to do this. But I think that that was why we're being published so much. So kind of to your point, we are able to show that all the students are being impacted. And we, you know, but the other thing is the effect sizes. So the biggest impacts are for the students that are black, which also makes sense. So if you have this attentiveness to each and every student and you're using relationships and data, you are gonna in particular uncover and unearth all of this talent in particular for students who historically have been overlooked. So I think that's another really exciting contribution that it, you know that everyone's doing better, the honors kids are doing better. And when I say the honor kids are doing better, can be reflected in their grades, but the other piece is it's reflected in their mental health. It's reflected in just because you are getting all A's and captain of everything does not mean at age 15 to 17, you're navigating life well, hence the riddle it in the beginning. How are you managing the stress? How are you managing the anxiety? And we know that this is what educators can do if they have the kind of the, um, not only permission, but the structures to do it, to, to deploy kind of their resources. So. Um, I will say I'm really proud of the research because we're really able to contribute to the field. One of the big contributions was when I started this work, there really was a disbelief that relationships in particular could change academics, especially at the secondary. So, you know, it's like nice to do relationships after you do math. And what we were able to show is relationships is the precursor. If you have a healthy relationship in place, students do better. So it can't be done after the fact. And we have this ironclad research over and over in terms of replicating the study because the other piece is we did this initial study in California and then the um, question became, was it an anomaly? So I'm like, let's try it again. So we did 12 separate within school randomized control trials. Basically any place that people said, well, it'll never work in a big kind of bureaucratic districts. And I'm like, then let's do a big bureaucratic district or it'll never work in a rural setting that doesn't have community resources. Let's go there. So I think that that's been, to your point, really exciting to have. I mean, we are, for being around for 20 years, you know, um, we're not in that many schools, but 200 is pretty exciting. 
No, 200 is a start. And I know that it'll just continue to grow and foster incredible discussion. And I know there's been some comments in the chat of, of people really being drawn to an idea that is proven. And, and Angie, I know you and I had that discussion that, you know, you spent all this time on research and now you want to like get it out to the world and truly start to like see the work come to fruition. And I have so much respect for that because there's so many ideas that we can bring to teachers that mm -hmm. don't have the data to support that it's actually going to make an impact mm -hmm. and your dedication to ensuring that it will mm -hmm. before bringing it into schools and feeling confident with the work before bringing it into schools is incredible. And I cannot wait for you guys to continue to elevate your story and elevate this, the students that you work with based off of all the work that you've spent so much time, you know, looking into. So I'm excited to get into some of these tactical tips and tricks. So we're going to transition here into our brainstorm bank segment. So we'll be right back. All right. You guys know that our brainstorm bank segment is a very, very intentional time for us to pause and ask you if you need anything. The Teach Better team created Daily Drop-In back in March of 2020 to make sure that we were here to provide you as much value as possible, but also just be here to brainstorm. We don't necessarily believe that we have the right answer or the solution that is going to be the perfect fit, but we do believe that as we brainstorm together, we'll be stronger and we'll have the opportunity to um, give you some opportunities to connect with other people that can be there to support you. So Angie, we are in our brainstorm bank segment and this time is really to foster a community of being brainstormers, trying to be eager to find solutions. Our theme this week is all about reaching all learners, which is why I knew you were gonna be such an incredible guest. And as we get into our theme, obviously welcoming any questions in the chat always, all the time, um, I'd love to hear more about kind of like the nitty gritty teacher work. You know, we say like bar has changed so many lives, but hopefully will change so many more. But what does it actually look like? Because as a teacher, I could be sitting back and listening to this and saying, oh, so it's like a program that students log into or, oh, it's a it's a framework that a teacher is going to implement or, oh, it's a strategy of activities that I'm going to incorporate. What is it? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. So I'll say, I think it's those that are teaching, you're going to see this is kind of it's very logical, but it's systematized. So there are both things and there's processes. So I'm kind of going to name them both. As a teacher, if my school took on bar, I'm going to have two days of training and what the model is. So I can actually understand the overall system and I can understand what my contribution is. Um, the person that trains you is your dedicated coach. So every school gets a dedicated coach. Um, 10 to 12 schools is what a, um, a coach works with. And I have to tell you, I actually had an interview with um, PJ Fleck, who is the Gopher head football coach um, two weeks ago. And he was talking about the term coach, which by the way, I now really love and I'm gonna be continuing to share it. He said, the word coach comes it's derived from the word stage coach. And a stage coach's role is to get you from one point to another point. And that's what a coach's role is. And that, once again, you need to know, know where you're at and know where you're going. So the coach who's going to work with the school is to say, what is your goal? What are you looking at doing? Because every school has different goals. Some schools are like, we need to, you know, kind of um, reduce our failure rates. Other, you know, schools are like, we need to have more Black, Latinx, and low-income students in honors classes. Others are like, we need to, you know, try to manage, you know, anxiety or substance use. Fantastic. So first of all, back to your piece. Bar has been proven. ACT named us the college and career going model. We are known to reduce substance uses. So we reduce tobacco use. We reduce suicide ideation. And we increase that, you know, math. We increase reading. We can reduce SEL. So we, we know we can do a lot of things. But you need to ask the school, what are you looking at doing? Where are you wanting to go? Then, the, you know, kind of we have mechanisms in place to make sure that the teachers really get to know who their kids are in a systemic way, not just kind of as a one off. So one of the things we have is um, their lessons. And for the secondary, they're called I times for um, elementary. It's called U times. 
When I developed this, I did not plan on having this be a national piece. This once again was a development for my school. I kept saying, pronoun I. This was way before iPhones or iPads, but I'm like, in high school, let's just let them talk about them. They really want to. So we're going to devote 30 minutes a week for I time, pronoun I. The lessons are not taught. The lessons are facilitated. It's about establishing a relationship so the students can see how to do this. It also provides the mechanism for the teacher to connect with the, te the students. So for example, if we do a lesson, <clears throat> what's on your plate? And I share, I have two kids, I like to go running, I like to do these other pieces. The student gets to know me in a different way. The student I know also works harder for me because they know who I am. It's not just this factory model. The other piece is when the student shares what they're doing, I have context of all the students I'm working with. So for example, if I don't get an assignment on Monday morning, I don't immediately assume, oh, they didn't care about this assignment. I'm like, oh, I know they had a basketball tournament. I know they have a part-time job. And prior to even approaching them, I have an awareness of who they are. So it provides this system to be able to be facilitating this relationship. So that's kind of back to the teacher. Now the teacher is gonna do the lesson like once a month because the teacher is gonna be in a team. We are not in a tight middle school block, but we are in a team. It's interesting when you look at schedules back-ended, students tend to sign up in schedules that kind of clump together. And we need to have the ability for adults to talk together about students. So if I do the lesson one week, maybe English will do the lesson another week, science, but our teacher team meets once a week. And once a week, we are discussing every student in our school. And I think that's a, a really key piece. The other key pieces in terms of discussing every student in our school, the school works with their coach and comes up with a system to calibrate their students. Students are leveled zero to three. It's similar to an emergency room. When I was a high school counselor, I had a list of names on my desk every day, and I didn't know if it was Hannah forgot her lunch or it's unsafe to go home today. So we work with the school to say, you need to have a, a system so you know who your students are at. Level zero means thriving. No one sees anything. Level one means something seems off. I'm walking through the cafeteria, students sitting alone. I'm you know, seeing just kind of some weird things. That being said, a level one student, one of the adults on the team will check in with the student that week and report back to the other adults. Perfect. Level two, we're seeing patterns. We've got attendance patterns that are changing. We've got work performance patterns that are changing. Now we are going to have a shared approach, teacher teams. Once again, this is teachers saying, we need to have a joint approach, just like when you're parenting. This is what you know we're gonna do. It could be they are so behind in math, the math teacher is gonna say, let's have the student not do math this week, and I'm gonna help you focus on English and science. And even during my class, you're gonna make up these assignments for one week, but it's a coordinated effort and it's the teacher's decision to say, this is what we're gonna do. And they evaluate it in two weeks to say if it's working or not. Level three is a key piece. Level three means the student issue has nothing to do with school. The issue is um, community issue, housing, insecurity, substance use. But typically when classroom teachers meet, they discuss level three students. That's who they talk about because they're so concerned about them. The reality is rarely can classroom teachers make an impact on level three issues and they miss level one and level two students that they can make a huge difference on. So level three students are referred to risk review. So there's three components of BAR that in particular are observable. I time lessons, teacher team meetings, risk review. Risk review is the community intersection that somebody is getting community resources to the school. The difference is that information is coming back to the teacher. So if I refer a level three kid, I need to know that someone's taking care of them. Otherwise, I'm gonna be really concerned about this, the student. I'm not gonna feel comfortable letting go emotionally unless I know someone has it, and then I'm gonna to continue to be looped in. So that was a both broad as well as a bit of a micro. So as a teacher, I'm in teacher teams, I'm giving eye time lessons, and I'm hearing what's with risk review, but one of the biggest things, it's tons of teacher empowerment. Teachers, in terms of the studies, say they feel more effective, they are more effective because they're given the real-time data. They're also given the power to, to make the decisions on what should we do about this kid. Our piece is 
you know, give it some time. But if it's not working, come up with another strategy. But it is right there given to kind of teachers that you've got this whole for perspective of the student. You know who the kids are and come up with a solution together. Check the data. If it doesn't work, try something else. If it does, fantastic. I mean, there's so many elements to dive into there, but one of the questions that we got in the comments was the idea of reaching each kid is often overwhelming for teachers. How do I begin the system this year? I'd love to have you answer this if you have an additional piece that you want to jump into. But for me, what I just heard of being able to even just say from you, Angie, to learn from you and say, okay, I could go to a, a team meeting, whether it be all the teachers, because of the environment I work in, I have that autonomy, or maybe just a few teachers, and I can at least use this tiered system, zero, one, two, three, mm -hmm. to ensure that I'm doing everything I can for my students. And what I heard from you, Angie, is the, the zero students we're building up, we're continuing to foster all those good practices. The three students are the one that I'm getting a larger group investment involved, like leadership, to ensure that we're doing everything humanly possible, our community is getting involved to support this child. But then my time and energy focusing on those one and two students really allows me to, to bring more to the table. And I love that the, I have this power and autonomy to be able to make that decision as a classroom teacher. So if nothing else, what a great challenge for teachers to consider today as they're moving throughout their Thursday to say, would I classify this child in mm -hmm. level one or level two or anything mm -hmm. in between. So mm -hmm. very, very cool takeaway. Any thoughts on this comment? Yes, so I think the piece is it is overwhelming for the individual teacher. I think our piece is working in community. So our whole piece is just like you said, sharing is that you know our whole model is predicated on, on putting you in teacher teams. So even in terms of you doing lessons, you're gonna do a lesson once a month. Now that being said, the information you glean, you're sharing with your colleagues. So for the next three weeks, when the teachers are, they're doing their lesson, you know, they're going to share that information with you. So you're going to continue to be learning more about that student, just like the very beginning on, even when the student's not with you. So I think that part of that pressure is if you are feeling like I got 46 minutes to try to meet, you know, and know each of these kids. If you know that your colleagues are doing the same thing and the information they find, they're continuing to share with you, your knowledge exponentially is growing in terms of knowing who the student is. So I think that not taking that pressure on yourself, but getting the system in place is a key piece because absolutely it's overwhelming. You know, I've, I've worked with and talked to so many educators over the years, but specifically this year where there really is this like island effect, right? Mm -hmm. Like we feel like we're teaching on an island. Mm -hmm. We even did like a live series, oh my gosh, years ago on the Teach Better team with Becky Thal, shout out to her member of the Teach Better family who like was like, we should do a, a webinar series called Teaching on an Island because so mm -hmm. many of us feel isolated. And that was way before COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, more than ever, teachers are really feeling like they are constricted and only, you know, able to control the factors within their current space. This concept of reinforcing the value of collaboration is essential. And I do have to say though, one element of this is is your community being open-minded to collaborate, right? It's hard to collaborate with people that maybe aren't as inspired or empowered to collaborate. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because, you know, members of the Teach Better family listening right now saying, oh my gosh, a collaborative environment where we can talk about students and make a massive impact, sign me up. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the first steps to even beginning the discussion of being more collaborative? So now I'll toggle back to the to the research. One of the things that Barr has been able to show that we do is we build collective efficacy, mm. which means that not only am I effective alone, that mm. collectively I'm much more effective. So that's one of the things that we really foster is collective efficacy, efficacy that I together working with others, that's when I'm really effective. So in terms of um, you know bringing this on, um, when you say, what is BAR? BAR is a culture change. BAR is a system. 
you know, that that is absolutely what we're embracing. We are huge believers, once again, in that the, the, the talent of your teachers is going to be your solution. Our other pieces, too, we coach and train to this model, but we believe strongly in local context because we do believe that your community knows your kids best and your teachers know your kid best. It's also based on the fact that we know inherently students are capable and talented. We know educators that chose this profession are incredibly gifted. So if the students aren't doing well or the staff is, is being challenged, it's reflective of the system. It's reflective of this culture we have to, to reestablish, but it isn't reflective of either the students or the teachers. And so I think that's what is exciting about the research that we've been able to do, that that isn't just like a belief. It's been shown to be true that kind of if you can open these communication pieces up, you know, and in terms of bringing the, the system in, um, I, I will say we learned some really valuable lessons by doing these randomized control trials. So when schools, um, because we had to intentionally work with a small number of teachers versus coming in full bore right away. So in the spirit of candor, I tended to be one of those teachers in the back of the room with my arms crossed going, I'm so happy you're going to teach me about relationships and data because it's not what I know. <laughs> so, um, so I get it. And I also know that this will make a huge difference. But what I think is easier in terms of entering a school system is take the willing. So we often go, you know, it's a three year model. You get three years of teacher and training. You get a dedicated coach. You can continue to bring others on. And when the wins start happening and the teachers that do it, teachers love this model. So I just, I mean, I have to be like really clear. So if you can enter a school and have the teachers that say, okay, sign me up. I'll, you know, kind of, you know, do this. I'll go to the training. I'll start these lessons. I'll work in a team. And then other teachers see them and other teachers are like, oh my gosh, this is actually really working. Then bring the willing. Different schools enter different ways. Sometimes they're like, it's all in right away. And we absolutely can do that too. I will say my preference as a teacher, I just, I continue to really respect the profession. And I love when people have the ability to, to opt in as they go. Cause I'm like, we're working with you for three years. So, you know, if you didn't make day one, it's not like we're going to kind of leave without you. Yeah, Angie, it's interesting. I mean, we've had so many discussions, but just to add context to Teach Better Family, we have the same approach. And I, I found so many similarities between your approach and your, your drive, your passion to work with teachers as so many that we find on the Teach Better Family where we don't believe in forced professional learning. We don't, we don't believe in that. We want to come in. We know what we do works. And we are willing to mm -hmm. get hands on and really get into the nitty gritty, like change making stuff for the people that are really eager to do that right away. And we're also willing to sit in a room for hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. and have conversation and bring research and just, just foster those beginning pieces of the discussion with the people that need time to process and decide how they're going to see themselves in these programs. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so much of that in the work that you guys are doing which I believe is really allowing so much of this work to be so effective because you're meeting people where they're at and you're allowing them to be themselves throughout the process. And what else could you offer a teacher than to say, you're incredible, take the time you need, you're the most intelligent person here, and we're just here to be your supporter and cheerleader throughout the process. And I just so value that about you and your team and the work you continue to do because I really agree with, the respect that you carry right off the bat and knowing your educators. I think that's a, a really key piece. I think once again, knowing that educators are so talented, knowing once again, in terms of the coach, coaches are always gonna be educators. So a coach that's assigned to your school is an educator. So they are the piece too that they're like, you know, knowing that it, it's a system that we have to, you know, kind of reestablish that once again, I keep going, getting the power back to that classroom teacher, allowing that classroom teacher to get to know their kids. Like, you know, even in terms of the comment, I think every teacher knows they're like, I can teach a kid better if I know them. How do I do that amidst my day in this factory? And how do I, and I think that becomes the piece of how do you share the knowledge? How do you have systems? So it also isn't just the kids that you happen to know. How are you having a system that, you know, 
I keep saying we provide, <laughs> but it's like you have a mechanism to be able to identify every kid. So this isn't, you know, kind of your responsibility alone. And I think taking some of that pressure off and then empowering the ability to be imaginative. So you've got that coming to you versus this overwhelming pressure of, oh my gosh, how do I connect with every kid? So Angie, I know that I've asked you dumb questions in private before, but I'm going to ask you one live because I always joke with like our Teach Better family and daily drop-in, I just get to sit back and ask all the questions and relax and hang out. But sometimes there are those like silly questions. You're like, I think I should know this, but I'm going to ask anyway, because there's probably someone in the room that doesn't also know the answer to this. But, but Angie, when it comes to this beautiful nonprofit you've built, you are committed to supporting educators so that you can support students. Mm -hmm. um, your team that I've met, oh my gosh, they're like the best people ever. They're they are so amazing. Our team is amazing. They're so uh -huh. warm and passionate mm -hmm. and they're all just like rooted in education. I just, you have really built a powerful team. Thank you. Um, but like, okay, so I hear you on Daily Drop-In. Angie's <laughs> phenomenal. I'm going to go Google you. I find the website, but like, how do I take steps? Because as a teacher, yeah. we have we have educators, classroom teachers right now listening, but we also have, you know, administrative leaders. We also have district office leadership. We have parents listening. We have board members listening. And when they're hearing you and saying, okay, research supported, good people making mm -hmm. an impact. How do I connect with Angie? It's not so much, I guess I will have you share your contact information, but what are the steps to like, seeing if you're the right fit for somebody, I guess. I think the, the first step is, I mean, to your point, yes. I mean, go into our website as a start, you know, so www.barcenter.org. And then shoot an email and ask for a, a webinar. So we do webinars all the time, you know, for, for teachers, for administrators, and it can be very personalized to be able to, you know, say, here are other schools that are, because then we can link you up to say, here's other schools that are in your area that are doing this. You can reach out to them. Right now is a really interesting time. So I will say the 20 years of research pays off well because we are an appropriate use of funds for almost every funding pot that's coming out right now. So it, it, is, it is helpful. So if teachers or administrators are like, I would like to do this. You can use money for reading. It is funny. People call us saying, oh, I'd like the bar math book. And we're like, so that's not our thing. Ours is a system. You can use what math book you feel is best, but you don't, it's not going to be, but we are, you know, kind of the highest level, re highest level of research. We show impacts from math standardized test scores, which once again, I think just goes back to the power of relationships. You know, we're able to show that kids not only do the work more, they learn better, you know, and teachers are able to deliver material better in this this structure. But anyways, yes, yeah, so there's lots of different funding you can use. We also can use right now all of the um, the opioid, opioid response money because we're, we're, we're a prevention program. We're a college program. So I will say it's confusing at times for the field. It's not confusing for educators. Educators go, well, of course this makes sense. Kids are healthier. What's positive is there's lots of funding sources that schools can use to be able to do this. But to your back to your point, I always think the best step is relationship. So yes, look on the website, you can you know see all the information, there's videos, but then say, hey, I'd like a webinar. And then people pop on, they'll talk to you, they'll say, this is a fit, this is not a fit, and then we can kind of move forward. I actually think people should only do that so they can meet your team. Like, <laughs> I think so too. Who are like, oh, bars are good fighter. If you're like, absolutely not, there's no way. Like, Ray is full of it. Like, that's fine. Just do it so we can hang out with Angie's group. That's there's like, Ray. I will say the same thing. Your team is awesome. I mean, like, I kind of go like, when we're no longer virtual, I think our group should just hang out together because well, you know we, we did just announce our Teach Better conference. Maybe you should come hang out with us. Oh, I would love to. I already put the dates down. I actually, if you saw, I lost my camera because during the commercial break, I'm like, oh, I should get that in my calendar. They're like, oh, I turned my camera off. So, but I, I got it down. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, I'd love to talk shop. That'll be so fun to have you and your team there. Yes. You know, we're gonna transition here, Angie, into our good news story. We got some holidays for the day. Um, we'll have you share your contact information, all that good stuff, but. I just really want um, all of our viewers right now to take a moment and think through, okay, I've been live with the daily drop-in for 39 minutes, getting to hang out with Angie. Um, one of the easiest things you could do right now if you want to challenge yourself of nothing else is, is think about that system. Angie, you gave those, those beautiful tiers. And, mm -hmm. and whether you move forward with any further exploration, mm -hmm. that is one tip and trick 
that you can mm -hmm. try and implement this mm -hmm. week throughout your day mm -hmm. to just say, where am I at? Where is my, um, where's my information at? And is there more information I need to collect to put my students in that zero to three scale? And if nothing else, what a wonderful reflection for us today. So we're going to head into good news articles, some good holidays. I can only imagine, Angie, you love to celebrate a good holiday. Oh, so we'll yes. So fun. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll be right back. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Daily Drop-In. We are 40 minutes into our conversation, and we are going to conclude our time together with some holidays and some good news articles. Um, Angie, I have a very serious question for you. I know we've talked about nothing important this entire time. This is the question. Are you ready? Ready. All right. How do you feel about chocolate? Oh, my gosh. Love. Love chocolate? <laughs> 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 but today is National Chocolate Day. So um, if nothing else, everybody's required to go eat a Reese's peanut butter cup or a love it. <laughs> go get a big like like slice of chocolate cake. I just think mm -hmm. it's chocolate in our life today. Mm -hmm. uh, so fun. It's also International Animation Day. Uh, it's First Responders Day. Holy cow. Mm. Talk about a crew that we should be thankful for. Mm -hmm. Definitely our incredible first responders. It's also National Immigrants Day, which would be an incredible discussion to have with your students. And something interesting, I don't know why I found this so interesting, but just in the world that we're living in, I thought I'd give you a little bit of history, and then we can decide what you want to do with it, friends. But today's October 28th. And um, on this day, Elvis Presley received the polio vaccination on national television. Ooh. In the world we live in today, there's so much debate on vaccines. We are not going to get into the right or wrong or opinions. But just interesting that Elvis Presley received the polio vaccine, vaccine on uh, national television. Yeah, back in the day. Ooh. So it's kind of cool. The other thing that I want to highlight is a good news story. Um, our community knows this, but just to add some context for you, Angie, we love to give holidays and good news stories every single day. So you can use it as a tidbit, as like a fun fact to build a relationship with a colleague as you're mm -hmm. passing them in the hallway, or even to bring this to your classroom, bring this to your students, whether you teach kindergarten all the way up to high school, and just say, hey, can we like build this into our content today? Can we foster some discussion? kind of build some humor, some relationships. Some of the facts are sometimes really warm and fuzzy. Some of them really foster some really deep discussion on science, geography. This is one that I just have so much love for as I was reading this. Um, this is a good news article from the Reader's Digest. And it says, building a new sanctuary for troubled veterans. And it says up to 30% of American veterans suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, while 14% of people who die by suicide in the U.S. every year are vets. Uh, many um, veterans also struggle with homelessness and addiction, but don't worry, Marty Weber himself is doing everything he can to combat this terrible, terrible statistic. He has donated over 15 acres of New Jersey forest to commit to the Just Believe Incorporated organization that will not only um, obviously have the land, but also create a retreat, a sanctuary for veterans who are struggling with anything across the gamut, addiction, mm -hmm. mental illness, homelessness. Him himself being a veteran uh, really wanted to create a space that was safe for mm -hmm. our veterans, that also took care of them, that had all the resources humanly possible to provide them. And while this is a brand new endeavor, um, it's definitely something that is a perfect example of somebody you know, trying to commit their life to doing good work, to serving others. And I know we've had a lot of discussion today about really being committed to serving others. So shout out to the incredible organization there who is committing some serious time, money, and resources to helping a very, very, very important community. So shout out to them. Very cool. Very impressive. So needed. Yeah, so needed. You know, Angie, as we kind of wrap up our daily drop-in discussion, 
Um, I would love to have you share your contact information so people can stay connected to you. And whether, even if it's just following you on social media, I want the awareness to still continue. And I know I told you this before we came live that I shared a post from you guys on my Instagram story, which mm -hmm. I love Instagram, but like, it's not the platform I connect with a lot of people on. I'm really active on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, but I shared it on Instagram and I had like seven teach better team family members reach out to me and say, Oh, we know Angie, we know the bar. We, we know how that works. And I'm just so excited to continue to bring you into our community. So I'd love to have you share your contact information. Yeah. I think the, I mean, the, Hit, hit in our website, www.barcenter, it's B-A-R-R, -R, center.org is kind of um, a key piece. And then, yes, we are on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, Bar Center. So, and what's really exciting about um, our social media is mm, almost all of our posts are of our schools. So we are constantly celebrating our schools, constantly celebrating the students, constantly celebrating. So if nothing else, giving them some love, I think is fantastic to be able to follow that. Oh, I love that approach. Good for you. I, I love it. Yeah, I've followed for quite some time now, and I love the inspiration, the tactical tips and tricks. And again, just your team does great things. So we love that we have just a fun family relationship with you guys. It's so, so nice. For everyone here, our Teach Better family, good morning. Happy Thursday. It's October 28th, and it's going to be the best Thursday that you've had all year. We're so excited to have you walk into and a, a beautiful day ahead of you, regardless of the weather, regardless of that meeting you have later. It's going to be such a wonderful day. We're so appreciative that you chose to spend your morning with us as we streamed live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. But also, even if you're listening to this after the fact on the Teach Better Talk podcast, we're thrilled to have you here. Make sure, by the way, friends, take a screenshot, share with us that you are watching, that you're tuning in. We always love to see people taking screenshots as they're listening on Apple Podcasts or anything in between and tagging the team. Um, so please let us know that you're around. And also, if you need anything, Angie's an incredible resource, and we'd love to continue to bring you incredible people to connect with so we can continue to make our own impact um, shout out to the Teach Better Conference release details that we just released, the date and location. Early bird registration is open. And if nothing else, I just want to tell you guys, it's $100 off. So please save your money. I really believe in not paying full price. I'm a sales fiend. So please don't pay full price. Um, and we really appreciate those of you who tuned in live with us last night. It was a really great celebration. So Angie, thank you again for getting up bright and early to have this wonderful dialogue this morning. And for everyone else, we hope you enjoy your last sips of your coffee, of your tea, of your water, whatever you're starting your morning off with. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow morning as we conclude the week with the one and only Brad Hughes here on Daily Drop-In. So thank you again, Angie. I so appreciate you. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right. Bye, friends.